This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Stanford Alumni Association, Howard Wolf. Produced by a voice from God. Well, yeah, thank you for us. that. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Reunion Homecoming 2008. President's welcome and panel discussion. We are quite pleased that you chose to join us here this morning. Before we begin the formal program, however, I would like to ask the members of the great Stanford class of 1958 to stand. I totally forgot that the lights would be down. Could the lights be raised for just a moment so that we can see the members of the class of 1958? Ladies and gentlemen, these stalwart men and women are here celebrating a Stanford milestone, their 50th reunion. We welcome them back. The Stanford Alumni Association has a very clear yet challenging mission. We seek to reach, serve, and engage all alumni and students so as to foster lifelong intellectual and emotional connections between Stanford and its graduates. As you might imagine, no single event can compare to the power of reunion homecoming celebration when it comes to achieving our mission. Magical things happen when more than 6,000 alumni spanning over 75 years of Stanford history come back to campus at one time each fall and immerse themselves in all that is Stanford. The sense of community that unfolds through this immersion is a glory to behold. A sense of family that would make Leland and Jane Stanford proud of what they had created for other people's children. To that end, I hope that each and every one of you fosters your own intellectual and emotional connections with Stanford and your classmates over the course of the next several days. It is very much why we invited you back. To help us get started, we offer a special panel discussion here this morning that we hope will foster a true sense of intellectual connection with the academic core of Stanford. The formula is seemingly so simple and straightforward. We focus on a subject of broad interest to alumni discussed by a panel of experts from the Stanford faculty and the alumni community. This simple veneer, however, hides the real power of the discussion the reason it resonates so deeply with members of the Stanford family. Over the years, you, our alumni, have made your desires quite clear. You want a panel with members whom you can trust. You want to hear from faculty and alumni who not only understand the issues deeply, but address the topic with historical perspective and intellectual rigor. Perhaps most importantly, you want to hear from objective scholars and leaders who aren't beating a particular political drum or forwarding some hidden agenda. We started working on this morning's panel six months ago. Much work had gone into our original panel <laughs> entitled, Going Green, Making It Work. Then the financial crisis hit last month and we started receiving calls from alumni around the world who were planning to attend this reunion. They all had the same request. Could Stanford please help us understand this mess? In response, <laughs> 10 days ago, we decided to replace our Going Green panel with the one you will experience later this morning, <laughs> understanding the financial crisis and what it means to you. We hope you agree with our decision to switch gears. We also hope you gain valuable understanding during the panel discussion this morning. But before we welcome our panelists, it is my great honor to introduce Stanford's 10th president. John Hennessy received his undergraduate degree in, at Villanova University and his master's and PhD degrees at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Like Leland Stanford himself, President Hennessy is a native New Yorker who was drawn to California by its pioneering spirit and unbridled opportunity. 
In Leland Stanford's case, it was the gold rush of the, of the 1840s that drew him west. In John Hennessy's case, it was a boom of a different nature, the technology boom of the 1970s, both in Silicon Valley and here at Stanford. In the years since he arrived on campus over 30 years ago, in 1977, John Hennessy has played numerous roles at Stanford. He has been a faculty member in electrical engineering, the department chair in computer science, the dean of the School of Education, the provost, our chief academic and budget officer, and for the past eight years, president of the university. Lest you think President Hennessy's academic accomplishments have been limited to the Stanford campus, he has been recognized internationally for his accomplishments as well. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. My favorite accolades, however, come not from national academies, but instead from the Amazon.com student reviews of his book used to teach computer science throughout the world. Here are my two favorite quotes from his loyal readers. Ain't no mistake about it, this Hennessy dude rocks the house. <laughs> I wish he had been my professor. And in a quote that sums it all up quite well, another reviewer shared the following. John Hennessy is to computer architecture what Elvis was to rock and roll. <laughs> Building on this rock store metaphor in the spirit of full disclosure, please know that President Hennessy did take a short sabbatical from Stanford in the mid-1980s. It was during this time that he founded a Silicon Valley company that later went public and through which he revolutionized the world of computer um, work by commercializing research he had spearheaded here on campus. Yes, that's right, just another example of an underachieving member of the Stanford family. John Hennessy's contributions to Stanford have been extensive. Perhaps most importantly, his love for this institution and Sten's sense of Stanford spirit is beyond compare. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please join me in welcoming the man who leads our great university into the future, Stanford's 10th president, John Hennessy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Howard. That was a great introduction. I expected to have a little blue suede shoes playing as I walked out here. Well, welcome back, everyone. We're delighted to see you here, and of course, I hope you have a great weekend. It's an exciting time to be at Stanford. It's an exciting time to be on Wall Street. <laughs> the good news is the exciting things at Stanford are good things. I won't comment on what's happening on Wall Street. A, a month ago, I welcomed our newest members of the Stanford family, the class of 2012. And in fact, I had a wonderful experience where one of my former students came up with his son. And I realized I'd been at Stanford for a very long time at that point. But I remind you all, whether you're here for your fifth reunion or your 75th, that you're members of this wonderful Stanford family and we're delighted to have you back. I should also remind everyone that members of the class of 1933, here for their 75th reunion, were high school seniors when the 1929 stock crash occurred. We should be asking them how we survive in these times. <laughs> I know how much you look forward to these reunions. In fact, when asked if he would be back, one alum from the class of 58 replied, hell yes, I'm coming back for my reunion. Stanford's the best thing I've ever done, and I've done a lot. <laughs> well, you've all done a lot, and you make us tremendously proud to be able to call you Stanford alumni. When I, come back, when I welcome you back every reunion, I like to take an opportunity to just go back through some of the years and really look at what has made this institution truly unique. Five years ago, a month, a month after I welcomed this group back to campus, we announced the formation of the Global Climate and Energy Project, pioneering a new long-term approach focused on one of the most critical problems we have trying to find an environmentally benign way to supply energy to our growing planet. Going further back, 10 years ago, some of you may remember the grand reopening of the art museum, which had been closed for almost a decade by the Loma Prieta earthquake. If you've not had a chance to stop by the Cantor Art Center yet, you should do it. There's a wonderful 10th 
anniversary celebration, including a wonderful set of work from Richard Diebenkorn, collected by his fellow alum and Deke fraternity brother, Carrie Stanton. Really worth seeing. In the 1990s, we were just starting to think about that incredible millennium bug that was going to bring down the world. The concern that most computers stored, most computers stored dates using only the last two digits. Stanford professor emeritus William Miller, one of the co-founders of our computer science department, predicted that the cost of fixing this might be greater than the cost of the Vietnam War. Well, I still remember being in Los Angeles on New Year's Eve night for the Rose Bowl game. We checked into the hotel and they gave us, yes, remember that? That was great. <laughs> we'll get back there, we'll get back there. I remember checking into the hotel with my wife and our, our two boys, and they gave us emergency flashlights and bottles of water in case the civilian infrastructure collapsed. <laughs> well, it didn't, and the good news, as my colleague Bill Miller pointed out, if we do it right, we won't have anything to worry about for 8,000 more years. <laughs> 20 years ago, Stanford celebrated its centennial coast to coast, and the Stanford Symphony Orchestra embarked on a 19-day Asian tour. This summer, by the way, the Symphony, the Stanford Chorale, the Stanford Taiko, and the St. Lawrence String Quartet toured China as part of the cultural ceremonies surrounding the Olympics. That concluded with two wonderful nights on July 3rd and July 4th when they appeared in the Great Hall of the People and the new Beijing Opera House playing, by the way, George Gershwin. <laughs> 30 years ago, a graduate student in physics answered a NASA ad in the Stanford Daily. Five years later, Dr. Sally Ride became the first woman and the youngest American ever to be in space. The 1960s were an interesting time for universities, a time of protest and activism. In fact, it was right here in Memorial Auditorium in April 1968, that a group of black students went up on stage and took the microphone from then Provost Richard Lyman. Meanwhile, on the other side of campus, totally unbeknownst to anybody here, Professor Norm Shumway was doing the first human heart transplant in the United States. The 1950s were a great time of growth and discovery for Stanford and our very first Nobel Prizes. Four Stanford faculty were awarded Nobels in physics in the 1950s, firmly establishing the reputation of Stanford's physics community for excellence around the world. Sixty years ago, we began the construction of the Hansen Laboratories for Physics to build a new billion electron linear accelerator, a year after a small prototype had been built in the basement of the physics department. This past year, by the way, we removed the remnants of that accelerator to make room for our newest quadrangle at Stanford. The new Center for Nanotechnology and Nanoscience will sit where that accelerator once stood. And 70 years ago, the School of Education building, now known as Coverly, was dedicated. The first dean of the School of Education, Elward P. Coverly, contributed his own funds to construct the building. This is a story I love to share with the incoming deans. And we may need it. <laughs> now, while you undoubtedly remember different highlights, you can see from these examples that we've always aspired to be an outstanding institution and that the pioneering entrepreneurial spirit goes back to the very beginning of the university. When I welcomed many of you five years ago, we were three years into the campaign for undergraduate edu education. And thanks to your remarkable support and generosity, we had already raised 90% of our goal. We were just beginning our foray into new multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. We had just launched the BioX program and opened the Clark Center, and the Global Climate and Energy Project was less than a year old. And a lot has happened since then. Two years ago, during reunion homecoming weekend, we launched the Stanford Challenge, our ambitious campus-wide campaign that corresponds to an equally ambitious vision for the university's future. This campaign will enable Stanford to play a larger role in seeking solutions to complex world problems 
and improve our ability to educate today's students for leadership in our global society. Think about the difference we could make if our basic research on stem cells could discover new therapies for diseases like diabetes or Alzheimer's. That's exactly the kind of work we're doing in the Stanford Institute for Cell Biology. And what if our best and brightest students got excited and interested in teaching math and science in our K-12 institutions? I'm sure as many of you know, throughout the US, American students have fallen behind in their knowledge of math and science. They actually begin in the first few primary grades at the top of the ladder across the world. But by the end of middle school, they've fallen halfway down. And by the end of high school, they're down out of the top 20. But what if we could bring faculty and students together, faculty from across the university, the education school, the sciences, engineering, to think about new ways to teach and instruct in this area? And imagine the impact if we could be the institution that found new ways to generate renewable energy we could save both our environment and our economy at the same time. In fact, that's the, uh, I was with a group of undergraduates from my first undergraduate dinner of the year, and they asked me, what's your hope? What would you really like to see happen at Stanford? And I said, I'd like to have that discovery of a renewable, cost-efficient energy source happen here. Because if we do that, we will have made an enormous contribution. But these are just a few of the questions that our researchers and scholars are pursuing and that the Stanford Challenge will help support. Many of these new problems require us to collaborate in new ways, to work together across different parts of the university, to break down the stovepipes and bring together the best experts. And that is one of the things we're trying to do through the Stanford Challenge. They also enable us to go after what my colleagues call BHAGs, big hairy, audacious goals. <laughs> the kind of thing that a university like Stanford should aspire to work on. The Stanford Challenge provides support for this work in a number of areas. First of all, to do this kind of groundbreaking work, we need new facilities, modern laboratories, and modern classrooms. This spring, we dedicated the Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamasaki Environment and Energy Building, referred to as Y2E2. Nobody says the whole thing. This is the first building in our new science and engineering quad, which will return our campus to the historic Olmsted plan, building out lateral quads. It's on the same axis straight through the main quad all the way out to the library. But it also represents our greenest building yet. More than a 50% reduction in energy use is achieved through novel methods of cooling the building. And one of the things you'll see, take a walk over there, you'll see that a building can be green and still be great looking. If you walk around campus, you'll see a number of other important construction projects. The new Knight Management Center, our new Graduate School of Business green campus, where the entire campus will be built with cutting edge green technology. That work has already begun if you take a stroll down Sarah. The Stanford Institutes for Medicine building, which alumnus Lori Loki just gave us $75 million to help build, is scheduled for groundbreaking. That will hold our new stem cell institute. The new John and Cynthia Gunn building, right behind Mem Aude here, that will house the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm actually putting this project on fast track because we need it. <laughs> and a building which we're still in the planning stages for the new Helen and Peter Bing Concert Hall, which will go over right next to the Alumni Center and Frost. But our challenge is more than about just cutting edge facilities. It's about people, people who advance knowledge and students who are educated here. With undergraduates, as many of you know, we announced a new financial aid plan last year, which will eliminate any family contribution for families with income below $60,000 and eliminate the tuition component for families with incomes below $100,000. And this past year, we had a record number of applicants, 25,000 students applied, and we had a record yield. 72% of the students we accepted chose Stanford. 
So our financial aid budget is under a little bit of stress right now. If you have any pointers about endowment investing, uh, let John Powers know. Uh, we will need every dollar we can from the Stanford Fund in order to continue to support our financial aid program. But we will support it. I had some parents who came up to me as they dropped their kids off and said, are you going to be able to give us our financial aid? I said, yes, we're going to be able to give you all your financial aid. We've also introduced a new university-wide program to support outstanding graduate students who are pursuing interdisciplinary research. It's often hard to find research funding when your research crosses disciplines or brings together two different fields. But that's often where the most interesting work lies. Our new Stanford Interdisciplinary Graduate Fellowships were awarded just this year for the first time. And we've got 12 outstanding students in these fellowships. But your support is key to making these programs available and to ensuring that we can continue to educate the very best students. Every gift, regardless of its size, makes a difference. When combined, they provide important need-based aid for students, support for innovative research, allow us to make improvements in the student residences, and support programs like our service learning at the Haas Center. And of course, your participation and your support of this institution is as important as your financial support. Stanford is a community that is well integrated and well supported by its alumni, and I think that is truly one of our major advantages. I know you share our belief in this important work, and as I've met many of you on reunions or at travels around the United States, I've been moved by the strength and depth and loyalty of Stanford alumni. In fact, I was just back in Boston last week, and the first question they asked me was, is MIT or Harvard the Stanford of the East? <laughs> I said it takes all of Cambridge to be the Stanford of the East. Well, and thanks to the support of many of you here today and the good sense we had to start the campaign in 2006 and not 2008, <laughs> we are now approaching $4 billion of commitments to the campaign. Thank you to all of you. But I want you to remember something. As important as it is for us to have these resources, it is the research advantages we will make and the students who will be educated here that are the most important results of the work that we do together. Now, I know I'm standing between you and a very important panel that you're eagerly looking forward to. So I want to conclude my remarks by just telling you about a new tradition that we're piloting this reunion weekend. Tomorrow, as you know, our football team will play Arizona for the reunion homecoming game. After the game, the team will remain on the field, and I invite each of you, as part of the Stanford family, to join them and our students in singing, Hail Stanford Hail. We began this tradition with a pilot with our brand new students at the San Jose State game, the team was enthusiastic. Coach Harbour helped them learn the song perfectly. <laughs> and they were out there with the band and the students. It was a wonderful Stanford moment. And we're going to try and make this now a new event at every reunion weekend. Thank you, and enjoy reunion. Thank you all. Now on to our panel. I think today's panel discussion hopefully will help us understand where we're going. I was asking the panelists early, what will be the low point on the Dow? I, I told them they could either tell me that or they could tell me the day that it's going to hit its low. I'll accept either one. <laughs> To kick it off, I want to in introduce our moderator, John B. Chauvin, the Charles Schwab Professor of Economics, and the Wallace R. Hawley, Director of the Stanford Institute for Policy Research. And John will introduce the rest of the panelists. John.
Well, thank you, and, and uh, good, mor- good, I guess, uh, morning. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to just say a word or two about uh, CEPR, uh, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, pulls together economists working on these kind of problems from, from all over the university, the, the Graduate School of Business, the Law School, the Engineering School, the Medical School, and the Economics Department. And in the last few years, we've uh, taken administrative responsibility for the public policy program that some of you uh, may have graduated from. And in your program, you'll notice that the, an edited version of the um, panel today will show up on the CEPR website uh, tomorrow. Now, I've been at Stanford uh, a long time. In fact, while you've been away, I've been here. I've been here for, well, this is my 36th year. I guess it's the 35th. I came in 1973. I'm reminded all the time how long I've been here. Last spring, I taught a course called Introduction to Finance. On the first day of class, after the class, this young woman came up to me, and she said, she made me feel very happy. She said, this course is really, I'm excited about it. It's been highly recommended to me. I'm glad to be in your course. I said, oh, thank you very much. Who recommended it? She said, my mother. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, just a little bit uh, <coughs> bittersweet. What can you say? OK, let's get on with uh, what's important here. Today, we're going to try to improve your understanding of what's going on in our economy. I know most of you have never seen anything like it, except maybe the class of 1933. And I know I have never seen anything quite like it in my 35 years at Stanford. From Wall Street to Main Street, Americans are feeling the financial crisis. Nationally now, housing prices have fallen about 20% in the last 18 months and certainly appear to be headed lower given the large inventory of unsold homes. In my opinion, there can be no doubt that uh, we are in the second major, have experienced the second major economic bubble in a decade. The first being the NASDAQ or dot-com bubble of eight or ten years ago, and now we've had the housing bubble of the past three to six years. As the housing bubble burst, home prices have plummeted, new construction has just about stopped, at least home construction, Banking and other institutions that hold mortgages and or financial instruments that hold mortgage uh, that are based on uh, mortgages uh, have uh, failed. Loan markets have dried up for everyone except those who are so financially strong that they don't need any money. And the stock market has lost about 40% uh, percent of its uh, value, and I haven't corrected that for uh, the last couple of minutes, uh, which... <laughs> Unemployment has reached 6.1% and undoubtedly is headed higher. Credit markets have frozen up to the point that even major companies are having difficulty borrowing uh, money. Uh, You may have seen last week that AT&T was complaining that it was having difficulty accessing the commercial paper market. Uh, GE's in a similar uh, situation or has been. Look, at if AT&T and GE are having difficulty borrowing money, what chance does the average employer have? Uh, so these are serious times. Now, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury have taken some unprecedented actions. The creditors and customers of Bear Stearns and AIG have been bailed out. Freddie and Fannie have essentially been nationalized, not to mention the government insuring money market funds. The Federal Reserve is now buying commercial paper and is setting up the process of acquiring up to $700 billion worth of so-called toxic assets. These are toxic because uh, you're embarrassed to hold them or other people are. Uh, I've come to refer to these securitized assets based on mortgages, often termed collateralized debt obligations, as mortgage sausages, in that their relationship to mortgages is similar to the relationship between sausages and pork. How do we get into this situation, and uh, how do we, um, you know, how how do we assess the the many and unprecedented actions that have been taken by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, and what can we learn from the crises of the past, both uh, domestic and abroad? What's the proper role of regulation and oversight in the financial industry? Who's to blame, or maybe a shorter answer would be, who's not to blame? 
What will the impact uh, be on the taxpayers, the investors, and the economy? How bad might this get? How long might this last? Well, 401k participants, or at Stanford, 403b participants, have to work for many more years than they expected. And how will we know when there's a buying opportunity in the stock market, or for that matter, the municipal bond markets? So we have a panel today to answer some of those questions. By the way, this is a very exciting time to be an economist or be studying economics. Uh, you know, I mean, every once in a while, economists get kind of uh, overconfident and they think all the important problems have been solved. That's obviously not true. And um, so I've noticed that the interest in CEPR has uh, grown rather dramatically in just the last couple of months. So today we have a very distinguished panel. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome our panelists? If they would come up, I will introduce them. So maybe only Stanford could come up with a panel, a set a panel in just a few days that is as distinguished as this. Uh, from closest to me to furthest to me, Dennis Lockhart, Stanford, 1968. <laughs> Dennis is the president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He was managing partner at the private equity firm Zephyr Management LP based in New York before that, and also was executive vice president of Heller Financial. Dennis, welcome to your 40th Stanford reunion. Thank you. John Taylor, Stanford, PhD, 1973. <clears throat> John is the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics and the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's also a former CEPR director and a current Senior Fellow at CEPR. He was the Under Secretary of Treasury for International Affairs for President George W. Bush. He is advising Senator John McCain in this presidential election. Given that this is a reunion weekend, I should mention, and many of you know, that John Taylor is an award-winning teacher. This is his 35th PhD reunion. Mark, Mark Wolfson is a consulting professor in accounting and finance at the Graduate School of Business and managing partner of Oak Hill Capital Management. And of course, I think his most important distinction is he's a CEPR uh, board member. Ann Cassell, Stanford MBA, 1985. <laughs> Ann is a managing director of Atos Capital and co-president and chief investment officer of its absolute return strategies. Prior to joining Atos in 2001, Ann was chief investment officer of the Stanford Management Company. So it's not an even, you know, five-year anniversary, but Ann, welcome to your 23rd MBA reunion. And Daryl Duffy, Stanford PhD, 1984, is the Dean Witter Distinguished Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business and President-elect of the American Finance Association. And I know uh, we celebrate these reunions every five years, but Daryl would be celebrating his 24th PhD reunion this fall, and so I guess next fall it'll be the 25th. So welcome. <laughs> so the format today, let me explain it. In the first part, which will last maybe uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, I will ask the panelists, uh, two or th each of them, two or three uh, questions while you think of questions that you uh, want to uh, ask, uh, we do have microphones in the aisles. I think there are four. And once we get to the part two, we'll go to the microphones and uh, you can ask uh, your uh, questions. Uh, if you don't address it to a specific person, maybe I will uh, uh, figure out uh, who best to answer uh, that uh, question. Uh, we have overflow rooms because of the timeliness of this topic. 
And those of you in the overflow rooms have cards on which you can ask questions. We'll get those cards to our uh, Stanford <coughs> alumni personnel to the microphones and they will uh, be asked. So everybody has an opportunity to ask uh, questions. Now I should tell you something about the first part, my questions. I'm going to largely choose my questions from questions that our current undergraduates asked a week ago to Daryl Duffy and Michael Boskin. And by the way, this was in the evening, last Wednesday, a week ago Wednesday, uh, more than 250 undergraduates showed up for an evening event uh, that we put together jointly, the economics department, the business school, and CEPR. But I can tell you, not 250 undergraduates don't come out to anything, uh, <laughs> usually. Uh, so there's a lot of interest. So they had, we had cards, they had 75 questions, and fortunately I saved the cards, and so I had no problem figuring out what questions uh, to ask uh, these people. Uh, now in some cases, since this event was more than a week ago, which is about a year in normal times, uh, I had to uh, update them. But I'm ready to, um, to get started. I'm gonna take my seat in this panel and then I'm gonna direct some questions. Uh, the first question will go to Dennis Lockhart. Before I get started, I would say, uh, if, if I don't say it, Dennis would have to say it. He's president of the Atlanta Federal Reserve. He is, cannot con uh, comment on Federal Reserve policy or, you know, how's Ben Bernanke doing or that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, please respect that. Okay. So as I said, uh, Dennis is first. And Dennis, could you summarize just what's your assessment of what is going on in the domestic economy and in the global financial markets at this time? Let me just give you a little context. I mean, just how alarming is it? And how, long, uh, how weak might the real economy get in 2009? Now, you only got three minutes, but there's one other thing. How will we know <laughs> if the housing market is beginning to stabilize? John, thanks for those questions. Let me first uh, say, and I know John Taylor will have some, uh, some serious things to say about being in MEMOD. I just want to say I'm, I'm pleased to be back in MEMOD. It brings back very fond memories of shouting expletives during Roadrunner cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, um, that image of Wile E. Coyote going off a cliff <laughs> uh, may be a little too close for comfort this morning. <laughs> John, let me, let me try a summary very quickly. Connecting the dots these days is, of course, extremely challenging, and, and you, you're doing it on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. But uh, the center of the problem is the dollar credit markets of the world, and the center of that problem is the interbank credit markets, which have, to a great extent, locked up in recent days. Uh, banks uh, think in terms of what they call counterparty risk, they assess the risk of lending to another bank uh, on a very short-term basis, usually a month or seven days, but today on an overnight basis. The maturities in this market, if there is lending going on, have shortened to virtually overnight. The reason that counterparty risk is so serious is because they, there's question about the, uh, the liquidity and perhaps even the solvency of those other banks based upon uh, a, an opaque sense of what they have on their balance sheets. Uh, it's difficult to assess how much exposure other parties have to the so-called toxic assets that John mentioned, and therefore uh, most banks are taking a policy of better safe than sorry. If you think about it, lending a billion dollars overnight to another bank for one day's interest is a somewhat, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, an imbalanced risk-reward. If you don't get the billion back, it's certainly not worth what you were going to get for one day's interest or one week's interest. So there is a flight to safety going on among banks and financial institutions. Um, and really the credit markets uh, from top to bottom, the large capital markets for credit, all the way down to community banks and small banks have uh, really locked up or, or, or tightened up. At the center of this is house prices. The problem started really July of 2007 
with the downgrade of some mortgage-backed securities at that time. It was a bit of a shock to the system uh, at that time that the downgrades occurred, and it began a, a process that I think is probably now best described after 13, 14 months as interactive, cascading, and cumulative. And that process has simply grown. House prices, U.S. house prices, uh, uh, around which uh, securities have been built that have been distributed literally all over the world are really at the center of this. It's the house price uh, from, from peak to trough decline has been uh, now uh, over 15 percent and is expected to go somewhat further. But we, at least in the southeast, where I spend most of my time monitoring the economy, we're beginning to see some signs of some markets uh, for houses bo bottoming out, some encouraging signs. Uh, sales levels, for example, have begun to arise and, and contracts, at least pending contracts, have begun to rise. The, the issue, of course, is getting financing for a house purchase. And that gets back to the credit crunch or the lockup of the credit markets. I would say we have some time more to go, John, in, in terms of uh, house prices. But we do need to see the stabilization of house prices in order to form a bottom for all of this. Well, we'll move on to John uh, Taylor. And John, I was going to ask you, you know, basically, what do you make of these multiple uh, bailouts, first company by company, and then the, what I'll call the omnibus uh, rescue bill uh, passed last week. And then the, la the second thing, which if you don't have time to get to it this round, we're going to get you next round anyway. As an advisor to Senator McCain, can you talk about what he would do, what his plan involves? Thank you, John, and thank you for all being here and, and coming back to Stanford. I uh, was a student here, as John mentioned, and always think of MEMOD, just that, by that abbreviation, MEMOD. But let's remember also this is a memorial, memorial auditorium. And in fact, I'd like to just mention it was first built to, as a memorial to the uh, soldiers and Marines and others who were killed in World War I. If you look at that plaque in the middle. And then we added many more in World War II. And we added more in Korea. And we added more in yeah. Vietnam. I, I don't know how to help him. Can't hear me, is that it? <laughs> how, how, uh, well, let me just say, uh, it's rather a somber beginning, but let me just mention that Memorial Auditorium is a memorial for uh, men and women who uh, lost their lives in service to uh, our country. And uh, today, uh, at 2 o'clock, actually, there's going to be a ceremony with a new section of the memorials, which are out there in the lobby when you come in. Uh, in honor of the uh, most recent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. as a new wall of honor, if you like. Uh, and a uh, lieutenant uh, who got his degree here at Stanford in 2003, a master's in uh, chemical engineering, uh, who signed up in the Marines, as actually Dennis did back in 1968, uh, and lost his life in Iraq just two years ago. So on your way out, look at those plaques and walls, and especially the one on the left. I think it will be rewarding for you to do that. With respect to the crisis, John, you asked about the, what is going on, what the responses are, and there's been a whole slew of responses. Thank you. There's been a whole uh, slew of responses. Uh, early on, it seems to me, the responses were not really focused on the problem that uh, Dennis has so clearly emphasized on the problems in the uh, credit markets, the fact that banks are unwilling to even lend to each other, but more just a general provision of liquidity. But I think the most recent actions, in particular the large uh, $700 billion rescue plan, is a effort to more coherently go after the credit risk problems that uh, Dennis mentioned. And remember how these began. In, in 2002, 2003, 2004, interest rates were held very low in the United States. They were very low for whatever reason. And in addition, you had government institutions like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guaranteeing a lot of loans that were purposely issued uh, at attractive uh, low interest rates. 
Th so those things together led to the development of securities and mortgages, which were quite questionable. They also led to this enormous boom in housing prices. As you know, that, you talk about a decline in prices recently, but they're following this enormous boom, and we're just coming back down. And whether we're there or not really depends on you know what the equilibrium is, and we just we just don't know. I I hope Dennis is right. We're getting close. But because of that decline, a lot of people are having trouble making their payments. Some people are walking away from their house because the house is worth less than the mortgage. And so this, this debt that the banks and others took on is more and more questionable. Some of it was packaged together in securities, which very few people could understand. And so the other banks and others are holding this. It's global because banks all over the world bought this, uh, these kinds of securities and others. So that's why it's a global thing. And so what you need to do about this is to provide some way to get these toxic assets, uh, troubled assets is the way it's described in the government, troubled assets off the bank's balance sheet so they can begin to lend again. And now they're very reluctant to lend. They don't know what the, the balance sheet of their banks they're lending to looks like. So the $700 billion, an enormous amount of money, is focused on taking those assets off the bank's balance sheet so they can lend again. Now, you asked uh, about uh, Senator McCain, uh, who I've been working with since really November of 06, talking about this, these issues a lot. And um, he's focused on the fact that housing prices have been declining, and that's something we need to address, and people are having trouble paying their mortgages. So his component of this, what he'd like to emphasize, is that not only should we be taking, the government should be taking the uh, toxic assets off the bank's balance sheets by this program, but in addition, we should be helping the uh, holders of the mortgages, buying some of those mortgages back and reissuing at uh, terms that people can actually pay on a case-by-case -case basis so that you're re actually rewarding people who have been doing the right thing. So it's really, it seems to me, like a two-pronged approach that you need. You need the purchases of the assets from the banks, and second, you need to get uh, the people who are actually paying mortgages and having difficulty making the payments given the, what's happening to housing prices help those. And I think you really need both here to make this work, and uh, that's what I hope we can get going fast, because now, of course, people are worrying that this, these programs are not being put into operation rapidly enough, and they're looking for uh, some implementation as soon as possible. Thank you. So you all remember sweating grades at uh, Stanford, and so uh, for Mark Wolfson, I thought I would ask him uh, what grades he would give uh, Ben Bernanke and Henry Paulson. <laughs> and after, since that can be quick with just a letter grade, uh, I thought after that I'd ask him, uh, since he's a uh, private equity uh, manager, what opportunities ex to exist in the midst of this chaos in terms of uh, new investments, uh, how would you be deploying money at this, po at this point? Hmm. Uh, well, th thank you, John, um, <laughs> <laughs> for, those, for those softball questions. Uh, l let, me, uh, l let me first congratulate the uh, sponsors of this uh, session for so seamlessly evolving the uh, subject matter from gro going green to going broke. <laughs> 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 Uh, or I might say more aptly, given the environmental theme, going green, from going green to going dark, but uh, <laughs> something like that. Um, when I agreed to serve on this panel, I never imagined, and this was just a short while ago, yeah. I never imagined there'd be so much to talk about. Uh, the world has changed so fast in the course of the last week that whatever initial thoughts I may have had, I've just had to throw away. Uh, I'm no longer in a position to uh, give joint grades to uh, uh, Bernanke and Paulson. I actually think we have to give them separate grades at this point. Uh, so perhaps I'm a little biased. Uh, after all, when I first started uh, my career on the faculty at Stanford back in 1977, it was a very short while before Ben Bernanke showed up as a young assistant professor uh, to develop his uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, expertise, and uh, I got the great joy of uh, uh, listening to uh, many of Ben's stories as a, as a student of the Great Depression, uh, which, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, was a remarkable precursor of, of some of the things that he's got to deal with today. 
I would, uh, I've been very impressed with the decisive action that Ben Bernanke has consistently taken. Uh, given the limitations that uh, his office provides him, I think I would, I would give him a solid A uh, for his grade. I think that uh, the other uh, half of the uh, partnership, uh, Paulson, uh, has done a pretty good job, a pretty good job. Uh, but I can't give him an A. Uh, I'd have to give him maybe a, a B or a B minus. And, and the reason I'd have to uh, uh, dock him a little bit uh, on his scores include the miscalculation of allowing Lehman to fail. Uh, I think that he takes primary responsibility for the decision to allow it to fail, and with his Wall Street pedigree and, and background, uh, he has to take responsibility for the miscalculation uh, and, and uh, uh, collateral damage that's resulted through the complex network of counterparty relationships that intersected uh, the many contracts uh, that Lehman was party to. Uh, that, in turn, has had a cascading effect on the deterioration and the seizing up of credit markets globally. And we are, unfortunately, at one of those uh, unusual, limited times when one wishes for uh, the presence of a benevolent dictator. The, uh, uh, the, the joint... Uh, the joint efforts of, of a uh, Bernanke and Paulson, if only they had the authority to act unilaterally to address these global problems, would be far superior than the uh, uh, delays in timing that we face uh, in the political process uh, through which they must operate. And so, unfortunately, the credit seizing that we're experiencing is occurring faster than the pace at which the, uh, the solutions can be applied. We need far more massive interventions in the markets today than the $700 billion uh, uh, program is able to deliver. Far more. Uh, we've gone beyond the point where purchasing distressed assets will be the solution to allowing lending uh, to be restored with the order it needs to be restored. The banks are suffering from massive undercapitalization. They need equity capital. They need equity capital quickly. They need equity capital because, for two reasons, assets have fallen and risk is higher, both of which require greater equitization. We need the banks to have confidence to lend to one another in the overnight markets. They've lost that confidence. The spread between the so-called LIBOR rate, and I'll mention in a moment why LIBOR is such a critical uh, interest rate in the global economy. Uh, LIBOR, the London Interbank uh, Offering Rate, the rate at which banks lend to one another overnight, relative to three-month treasuries, has grown to a level not even seen in the banking crisis of 1973-74, uh, preceding the... Uh, the Great Recession of 74, 75. That spread uh, has ballooned as of this morning to 460 basis points. That's enormous. Now, it's been estimated that some $350 trillion of financial contracts are tied to the LIBOR interest rate. That's why it's so important. These are contracts that range from residential mortgages to commercial loans, to all manners of derivative contracts. This rate needs to be brought down promptly. Banks need to have confidence to lend to one another. I believe what will be required, and I believe we are likely to see, is that for the solvent banks, their short-term credits need to be guaranteed. In fact, we need to go beyond that. The commercial paper market is so uh, disrupted at the moment that for the largest, most solvent uh, uh, industrial uh, corporations, to which John was referring earlier, their short-term credits need to be guaranteed. Interest rate cuts as massively and as uh, uh, broadly as they occur throughout the, uh, the world 
need to be reduced significantly further. And it needs to happen soon. We need a temporary moratorium mortgage foreclosures. These are desperate times, I'm afraid to say. The proposals that were initially made were reasonable, could have solved the problem if implemented immediately. Even the several days delay uh, of, the, of the US Congress uh, uh, took a great toll on the system. And um, uh, my great hope is that this weekend, the G7, the G20, will uh, act in a coordinated fashion to massively intervene in the markets to restore confidence. I would not be shocked, given the difficulty of affecting this coordination, if the stock market were to be closed for one or two days on Monday or Tuesday in order to ensure that a coordinated solution to restore confidence and, uh, well, and, and smooth functioning in the credit markets, which is the linchpin to the solution of getting equity capital invested, uh, could be accomplished. And, and, and by the way, just very quickly on the last point, uh, we probably need somewhere between 350, 500 billion dollars of fresh equity capital to be invested uh, in financial institutions. Uh, as attractive as the opportunities may ultimately become for the private equity community, the private equity community can perhaps supply 30 to 50 billion dollars of that. And uh, that means that uh, the private equity community, by being able to do deep dives and due diligence that uh, the, the, the public can't uh, do so easily, can perhaps help jumpstart that, that process, but uh, it requires an awful lot of additional capital from the government and from others in the, in, the, uh, in the private sector who are not participants in the private equity markets. Ann. Um, <laughs> I have a couple questions for Ann Cassells. One is, uh, there was this uh, temporary ban on short selling for a large number of stocks. It was lifted yesterday. Was that move a well thought out move? And then a more loaded question is, were the rating agencies bought off or were they just overmatched? <laughs> <laughs> let, let me try to take the second question. Uh, First, which is, I think the rating agencies in general were overmatched. Um, they have a tendency to build models of how credits will behave based upon the past. And so when you get um, a substantial change, something like a regime change or an entirely new market, uh, those markets, those uh, models just aren't very stable. And very specifically with regard to subprime and other kinds of innovative and more risky mortgage models. Um, they base some assumptions that defaults would uh, occur at a level that they had in the past when these markets were much smaller. And it's very difficult to build a model for, uh, to assume that the default levels that you'll have for a, a market, which in the case of subprime really was about a $50 billion a year market, will be stable when you grow that into a $600 billion a year market. Suddenly, you're lending to new people under new conditions, and those assumptions really aren't stable. And uh, I don't think they took that into account. Um, I think it's also true that the interests were aligned in a way that was really non-optimal for getting the right results, in that people were able to sequentially work, uh, people who wanted to issue things, let's say, like collateralized debt obligations, were able to go to the rating agencies and actually work cooperatively with them to get the best ratings, and since they were going to be the ones to pay for the ratings, if they didn't like the results at rating agency A, they could then go have a discussion with rating agency B, so that that wasn't optimal. Um, someone will correct me, but I believe that for someone like Moody's, it, uh, rating things like CDOs may have gotten to the point where it was equivalent to 40 to 50 percent of their revenues uh, around the year 2006, and uh, it's often the case when you have a new product that 
uh, is growing revenues really quickly, that can skew the incentives inside of an organization. Um, as to short sales, I think it's fair to say that uh, what, two weeks ago, Wednesday, it really did feel like the market needed a timeout. You know, at the point at which we, you know, following Lehman and AIG, we got the dramatic falls in Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs stock. Um, and I think Mark's point is very interesting that maybe we will have a timeout for the markets on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, I was thinking about being away from the office on Monday since uh, it's a national holiday and the banks and the Federal Reserve are closed, so it might work well for my personal plans. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I think the ban, the temporary ban on uh, short selling 799 financial stocks, which rapidly expanded to probably 900 or 1,000 stocks, and I'll explain how that happened, will probably come down in history as a good example of the unintended consequences of regulation. Um, let me just try to clarify a couple of quick things about short selling. I think in recent years, uh, people have gotten the idea that uh, short sellers are mostly speculators, that they are often engaged in a practice called naked short selling, which uh, has a certain exciting <laughs> tinge to it. <laughs> And you know, that they're actively involved in spreading rumors and trying to drive down uh, the stocks of companies. That has not been my experience, and I've been working with hedge funds for you know, 13 plus years. My experience is that short sellers fall into you know, one of several categories. One would be fundamental equity analysts who have done their work on companies and believe that in the long run, a company is gonna have deteriorating fundamentals. An example might be someone who looked at the balance sheet of Wachovia, looked at the enormous amounts of option arms and thought, that's a risk and they tend to hold their positions for a fairly long period of time, so they're not day trading stocks down. Uh, secondly, uh, naked short selling, which is selling a stock that you don't intend to actually borrow and deliver into the trade, has been illegal since 2004, and I think hardly ever anyone ever practices this, so I don't think it's been a factor. Um, there is some substantial short selling in the market from people who are engaged in buying convertible bonds, and selling stocks against that. I just want to note that uh, convertible bonds can be an important source of finance for a lot of companies, including for a lot of financial companies this year. So one of the unintended, unintended consequences of putting this ban on was to completely disrupt the mar market for convertibles by making half of their business strategy uh, temporarily illegal and unfeasible. So I think that most, uh, at the end of the day, most market practitioners, most academics uh, find that short selling is probably beneficial in the market in terms of uh, adding transparency and uh, keeping prices more stable. I think that what uh, Cox and the SEC did was really mostly disruptive and caused a lot of volatility in a short run. And uh, we may have some changes to short selling um, in the long run, but I don't think this was a great way to approach it. I just make one last note, which is um, people who are long and short stocks have sometimes said to me, you know, if I see a CEO and I'm short his stock, um, one of the things I can say to him is, do you realize I'm one of the only people in the world who has to buy your stock someday? <laughs> <laughs> and some people do think that uh, some of the downward trends in the market until yesterday were exasperated somewhat by the fact that uh, there weren't short sellers out there ready to buy. Thank you. Daryl, um, hitting a little bit close to home with Daryl's research. Uh, Daryl, was, was there too much financial innovation? Uh, did these mortgage-backed securities and then the more sophisticated collateralized debt obligations and so forth, did they contribute to the bubble? Thanks, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> another, another softball question. <laughs> it's, it's hard for me, uh, having taught um, credit derivatives and uh, CDOs uh, <laughs> to turn around and say, yeah, they, they're at the <laughs> epicenter of this earthquake. But um, yeah, they certainly contributed. Back in the, back in the good old days, uh, homeowners used to go to their banks and take out a loan for, to, buy their, to buy their homes. And the, and the bank would monitor the quality of that borrower because they had what Warren Buffett called skin in the game. Uh, and then financial engineers uh, came along and said, you know what, we can probably do this more efficiently. We can package these home loans together, send them off to Wall Street, uh, slice them up into 
uh, relatively riskier parts than the average home loan and relatively safer parts than the average home loan and then send those packages off to other investors. And because we get to access the entire global market of investors, uh, giving each what they want, um, there'll be more demand for mortgages and we'll be able to offer homeowners uh, interest rates that are lower and afford, uh, more affordable. More homes will be bought and this was a good thing for a while and then it wasn't done very well. What happened was, without skin in the game, the banker was passing the risk on to Wall Street. Uh, the home loans weren't carefully monitored. Borrowers were asking for loans that were bigger than they could afford. That drove the prices of homes up because there was plenty of demand for these risky mortgages, so more people would go out and buy more homes. And uh, Dennis and John talked about the fact that home prices went very, very high. Meanwhile, back at the ranch on Wall Street, um, the packaging, uh, and Anne referred to some of this as well, the packaging of these started to get out of control. The financial engineers at the banks, at the rating agencies, the regulators, didn't really look around corners to see whether these designs, these portions that were relatively safer were in fact safe. And what were thought to be uh, good extra yields offered on these seat, uh, collateralized debt obligations turned out to be not such a good deal after all. The, the shocking thing about this is that rather than passing on these so-called safe but really unsafe CDOs to uh, investors, uh, you know, small unsophisticated investors around the world, the biggest banks hung on to these CDOs, they themselves being fooled by the so-called safety of these instruments and that's how they got into the trouble that, that Mark described. The problem right now is we don't know what these CDOs are really worth, and that's why one bank is afraid to lend to another. And this bailout package and the more aggressive measures that Mark Wolfson suggested will now be necessary in order to get the market more transparent so that banks can see, yeah, they're not holding a lot of these opaque, difficult to understand instruments, they're holding cash, They've got more cash than they had. Now I can afford to lend them money. And, uh, and once the liquidity returns to that interbank market, which has really become the epicenter, it's no longer the CDOs and the mortgages. It's now, will the banks lend to each other? Once that gets going again, uh, then, then we'll be in much better shape. Okay, so now we're going to change the rules just a little bit. Um, as they say in the game shows, we're going to the speed round, so I need short answers. <laughs> and uh, in the speed round, while we're doing the speed round, you should be get ready to ask your questions. And with these lights, I can't really see them, but I take it we've got mics here and up there and here and there. We're going to go around the room with mics, and that'll all start in, in less than 10 minutes. So get ready, but we'll go <coughs> one more round, the speed round. Okay. <laughs> And I'm really relying on the class of 2009 and 2010 for my questions. Okay, here's a, a question from the undergraduates. It's for, for President Lockhart. One of the undergraduates asked, in what ways do you think the U.S. economic recession will resemble that of Japan after the collapse of their stock market and real estate bubble? And what can we learn from the experience in Japan? Very good question. Um, the, I, I don't expect that our experience going forward from here out, and we, uh, we don't typically use the R word in the Federal Reserve, but in the, <laughs> um, in the uh, downturn that we're experiencing. <laughs> um, That's good. Our clock you know, I, I don't expect we're going to resemble Japan for oh, a couple of reasons. Uh, one would be that uh, we actually have taken pretty serious action to date. I would uh, point out not only the interest rate cuts that have occurred, uh, and now 375 basis points from September of last year, as well as the introduction of liquidity facilities that are highly targeted on illiquid markets now. Uh, I think five different liquidity facilities. I believe someone mentioned just a few days ago that we introduced a program to uh, directly purchase uh, industrial commercial paper, in effect lending directly to non-financial companies. 
the Troubled Asset Relief Plan, $700 billion, so-called TARP, um, I think is a significant and comprehensive program to attack really the, some of the root causes of this problem. The fact that we have taken all these measures, I think, is going to uh, distinguish our experience from that of Japan. The institutional structure in the United States is quite different. Um, the amount of transparency in many respects and the willingness to, to step up uh, and attack a problem, I think, uh, will be different than what Japan experienced. So I, I, I have no expectation that we're going to see a lost decade kind of experience that unfortunately Jan, uh, Japan experienced. Okay, well, then we'll go to John Taylor, and, and, and I'm sure the undergraduates would get a kick out of asking John tough questions instead of the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the question. This is from an undergraduate. Free market advocates advise and enforce upon other countries when they get into an economic mess to tighten their belt, let weak enterprises wither away, and other such advice. What does the current market intervention of the U.S. government do to the credibility of our traditional advice. Better yours. Well, as a free market economist, that's a tough question. <laughs> Let me say, first of all, as you heard me describe how we got into this, I did mention a couple of government actions. Uh, and in particular, the Fannie and Freddie and the actions of rates being very low. Those are government actions. Uh, there were people who were saying we were, were excesses in the government supporting these markets, largely Fannie and Freddie and other, other things like that. So to me, this is largely a matter of government failure that's led us to this situation. It's not really dysfunctional markets. It's really the government's encouraging certain activities that they could not have done, should not have done. So that's, you know, it's, it's a, maybe an oversimplification, and obviously there's been some, some uh, players, irresponsible players, who have, who, in our financial markets, who financial markets are based on trust, and we've lost a lot of trust uh, from certain individuals. But it seems to me that when you think about the nature of this, it is really, not a problem with free markets, it's a problem with a government uh, failure. Not a market failure, it's a government. And believe me, we do have market failures, lots of them, and we try to correct those. But this seems to me is more of a government failure. So in that situation, it seems to me government has a responsibility to fix the problem. That's what we're trying to do, and that's what's actually happening right now. And I would say as soon as we do the actions we're doing, we should be thinking, in fact, as we do them, thinking about how to you know, get the government out of places where it has caused trouble, and get the problem into places where it can correct, such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, control the, the enormous growth of those. That was irresponsible, to let those institutions grow the way they did. Completely irresponsible. And we can't keep doing this. So that's, how I, that's, that's my view, and I think it's, it's quite consistent with the idea that free market economics has contributed an enormous amount of good in the world. It's removed hundreds of millions from of poverty and around the world. And, we don't want to lose that message as we think about the problem that we're facing right now. Okay, uh, then we're gonna have Mark uh, Wolfson. I want to remind everybody this is the speed round. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I got a two-part question. I had to update it because the undergraduate asked it a week ago. <laughs> what is the market signaling when AAA municipal bond interest rates are higher than federal government interest rates of the same maturity? And the second part is, the VIX index today is over 70. Can you explain what the VIX index is and what this means? <laughs> uh, well, municipal bond uh, yields being uh, higher than taxable yields simply means that the expected default rates on the uh, uh, municipal bonds is in a different uh, zip code. It's in a different, uh, uh, wholly different uh, realm uh, from government bonds. And so uh, basically the tax exemption is overwhelmed the benefits of tax exemption uh, it, it, it are, are simply overwhelmed by the expected defaults and the credit uh, challenges that the municipalities face. So that's, that's pretty simple. Um, I, I, uh, uh, 
I might append to the list I mentioned earlier the, uh, the, the, the need for massive uh, uh, extension of, of credit to uh, municipalities to, uh, to the list of things that are required uh, in the short run. Uh, VIX index. So VIX is a uh, common measure of assessment of risk in the economy. It's the so-called volatility index. It's technically a forecast of what the volatility, the standard deviation, the, the, uh, uh, the movement of stock prices that are forecasted uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of months. Uh, it's reached modern day highs uh, in the low 70s. Uh, the average volatility index, the average VIX, tends to run in the high teens. High teens. It's, it's trading over 70%. I will say, uh, I don't know that this will make you feel a lot better, but it's estimated that during the market crash of 1987, the volatility index actually, if appropriately calculated, would have been 150. That was over a very brief period of time. Uh, this one has been trading at an elevated level now for a much more extended period of time. It's a sign of the extraordinary degree of uncertainty that we face in the market today, um, just as the the, uh, the so-called LIBOR spread to which I referred earlier is, uh, is just another measure of that. I must say there is confusion. I was listening to the uh, TV this morning and one guy was saying, you know, there's a tremendous risk of inflation and the other guy was saying there's a tremendous risk of deflation and I was uh, <laughs> a little left, less confused, but uh, so that may be a question that may come up. <laughs> Okay, so Ann Cassells. Now, Ann and I actually were at a dinner together a Tuesday night, and George Schultz said the following. He said that a big part of the problem is that Americans are simply living beyond their means. The government spends more money than it has. <laughs> Households buy houses that they can't afford. We simply need to get back to saving and living within our budget. So I thought I'd ask Ann what she thought of the former Secretary of State, Treasury, Labor, and Office of Management and Budget. <laughs> I guess OMB is not a cabinet, it's not a secretary <laughs> position. You know, I just want to say Secretary Schultz is just such a great man who has served our country so well and is such a good friend of the university. Um, And uh, maybe I'll do a shameless plug for CEPR because one of the joys of uh, being a corporate sponsor of CEPR and going to that is, is getting to be around him. Um, and he's also been contributing a lot with some of his ideas on energy. I think he's really on to something here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, if we talk about the mortgage market for a second, let's just remind ourselves that not everything that happened was subprime mortgages going to poor people. There were a lot of people who refinanced mortgages, home equity loans, you all saw the ads on your TV, and took a lot of money out to you know, finance an improvement in their lifestyle. Sometimes it was a vacation, sometimes it was tuition, sometimes it was an emergency medical need. There were lots of things going on, but we could argue that we used home equity extraction as a substitute for savings over the last seven, eight years. And we could even argue that perhaps some of this was um, a response to the fact that as America ages, there's a big cohort of people who needed to be increasing their savings. And maybe instead of doing that, they did the home equity extraction. The extraction was equal to you know, probably a trillion plus dollars several hundred billion dollars a year that was almost like disposable income and a heavy part of GDP. So to the extent that we're unwinding that, um, that is a serious headwind. And I think the Secretary is right. We are going to need to save more, and that's going to make the totality of circumstances a little bit more daunting. Um, I want to give John a little plug here. We've, he and I have been talking for some years about how do we deal with the demographic shifts, things like entitlements, and you know, one answer that starts to come up is it's quite possible that some of this will resolve itself by people working longer. I want to give John a lot of credit for pointing out the fact that because people live so much longer and are so much more healthy and vital at every age level, that that's 
something that is an extremely doable thing, and we may be, I think we might be just on the cusp of that starting to happen, and in some ways that may be part of the sacrifice that the Secretary was talking about. Does that mean the class of 68 will have to work longer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just the class of 85. <laughs> But we'll have to work longer than you, even. <laughs> also means we'll see you back here in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, Daryl, um, Mark hinted that, uh, that maybe the failure to bail out Lehman was a mistake. Uh, we were going case by case, but on that case, we decided we wouldn't do it. What do you think? Was that a mistake? Yeah. I I have to endorse Mark's grade. Uh, I'd say all of the solid A down to the B or B minus could be uh, attributed to that decision. Um, actually, the, the day before, I got a call from a London pub. There were two, two contacts at, uh, at big banks that trade credit derivatives, which I'm sure will come up in this discussion. It said, will uh, Hank Paulson allow Lehman to fail? And I said, you know, he said he needs to draw a line in the sand to prevent what's called moral hazard, which means that if you keep bailing out financial institutions, uh, you know, you're just encouraging them next time to take more risk. And moral hazard was the, was the catchphrase of the day a few weeks ago. Uh, now, uh, when, when the house is burning down and the, the fire crew is there and the firefighters are hosing down the house trying to put the fire out, it's not the time for them to turn off the hose and to tell the homeowners, a, a, give them a lecture about smoking in bed. This is, <laughs> this is the time to complete the job of putting out the fire. And, uh, and I said, no, I, I, if he, he's going to draw a line somewhere, but he can't afford to allow Lehman to fail because that will do two things. That will first cause a massive unwind of their balance sheet. Um, today, this morning, there is on the order of, let's say, three, four hundred billion dollars, a billion here, a billion there, it doesn't matter anymore, right? Three, four hundred billion dollars will be paid on der derivatives linked to Lehman, partly because so many people were exposed one way or another through Lehman's balance sheet. So Le all, all of that flew apart very quickly, and that disrupted financial markets. But even more important than that now is the fear and panic that sets in when a when a household name, a firm like Lehman that's been around since eight, the 1860s, which was a linchpin of, of Wall Street, when it na a name like that goes down, it strikes fear into the ordinary stock market investor. And I was asked yesterday by a reporter, when, when, do, when does the fear and panic stop? And I said, well, set your clock based on how long it's been since the last major financial, financial institution failed. And when, when enough time goes by, investors will start to achieve a level of calm that will allow them to, uh, you know, invest their money again in a way that will support the stock market. So the two things, the unwinding of the balance sheet and then the psychological effect on fear and panic, both suggested even before the line was drawn in the sand that that would not be the place to draw the line. So I, I totally agree with Mark on that. Now, having said that, they, Bernanke and Paulson, this is, this is uh, hindsight, right, Mon Monday morning quarterbacking, they had so many tough decisions to make, and they made probably 50 equally big decisions in the last few months, most of which they handled extremely well. So um, I don't think, uh, ha with the uh, sitting here today in the armchair uh, trying to, to uh, um, uh, one wouldn't want to criticize them too, too badly for, in the heat of the moment, uh, trying to make a tough decision. Okay, I need your help. First of all, y y go to the microphones. Part of the reason I need your help is I can't see the microphones. Uh, so if you'll go to the microphones and if you'll kind of coordinate, maybe I'll be able to see in a minute. Uh, but uh, so what we're going to do is going to rotate uh, which mic gets the first question. And if you could give your name and your Stanford Reunion class, and then we'll go to the questions. And we might as well go to the lower mic on the right, on my right, first. So your mic is 
okay. Hi, my name is Roy Miller. I'm from the class in 1973. What was the problem? And I just wasn't up loud enough. It looked like it had shifted maybe a little bit. Been thinking about the endowments that all the universities had. We just heard that ours has gone up by four billion in the last two years. Is there something these 15 or 20 large universities could do if they got together and said, we're going to do this with our endowments in the next six months as a symbolic move to help the economy? Well, I think that uh, must be aimed at Ann Cassells. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure how much a symbolism from the largest universities would matter right at this moment. Um, I assure you that if they did anything, it would be symbolic. The, as proud as we are of Stanford's endowment, uh, the assets of the large ten, uh, largest endowments in this country are well less than a tenth of those of the largest pension funds. Um, that in part explains a lot of the success they've had. They're smaller, and so they've been much more nimble. So I think in terms of the stock market coming back, for example, it's going to be things like rebalancing um, on the part of the large pension funds that are probably really going to make a difference. But I'm gonna, I, I wanna take a moment of a personal privilege here to answer a question that John and I had talked about. Um, you know, the, the large endowments have done very well for a long time because they've been smaller and more nimble, and particularly because at a place like Stanford, uh, John Hennessy and the trustees have wisely delegated an enormous amount of discretion down to John Powers and a very uh, professional staff there. And that has allowed them to do things that are very uh, long-term in horizon, to do things that are contrarian. And contrarian has become a very popular, has, has become a, you know, a very au courant word recently. It means unpopular. <laughs> um, when I was chief investment officer of, this, of uh, Stanford Endowment in the late 90s, it was unpopular to own things that weren't tech, to own things like real estate or emerging markets or commodities. Um, putting those kind of things in the endowment really helped it over the long run. Some of that's about diversification, not just across asset classes or regions. Some of it is also about diversification across levels of valuation. So that's one of the things that's been very helpful for endowments. I'll just say in recent years, many, many people have followed that lead, and so all of those boats rose a lot, and that's part of the explanation for why they've all fallen a lot recently. But I just want to say that I actually think in these kind of markets, the endowments will continue to outperform. We may have a couple of rough years, but that ability to do things that really are very far-seeing, that are contrarian and unpopular, uh, will allow them to lay the groundwork now for future returns. So I have a lot of faith that Stanford's endowment, while it might have a rough year or two, is going to, uh, is going to do much, much better than the markets in general. Mark? I just want to add real quickly, I think uh, university endowments will play a natural role in the, uh, in the recovery. And the reason I say that is we're in a, uh, we're in a liquidity crisis. Uh, there are liquidity providers and liquidity demanders in the marketplace. The liquidity providers are the ones in the best position to supply liquidity. Those are the longest term investors. And uh, the university endowments have the luxury yeah. of knowing that they're going to be around uh, for decades and therefore they can commit to asset classes that are relatively illiquid and do so aggressively when the world is willing to pay them the most for supplying liquidity. The world needs liquidity the most today. The university endowments, particularly the leading ones like Stanford, will be natural suppliers of liquidity as soon as uh, the market, the market stabilizes. Okay, we're going to double speed round. Uh, is there a mic on the uh, upstairs on, the, on my right? Hi there, uh, Ross Shell, class of 1989. Uh, I think we're probably all in favor of prudent action during crisis, but I have some pretty serious concerns as we look forward six months from now and wake up uh, and look at what the government continues to make commitments to that we may have put ourselves as a government into a high credit risk situation and even an untenable one if you have a, a, a dramatically shrinking tax base in a recession. So to be specific in my question, when I, when I hear the proposal uh, from McCain about uh, essentially what I'm understanding as principal reset or adjusting the cost basis on mortgages, uh, help me understand that more. I guess this is addressed to Professor Taylor. Are we talking about 
a, a new cost basis for people who are struggling to make what about mortgages. On our left, is there? But we're not talking about then adjusting cost basis for people who continue to make their mortgages. That to me seems this, this, a step into uh, socializing housing. And uh, I wanted a little more explanation. Sure. The, the problem, as we talked about, is these declining home prices, right, which are putting a lot of people underwater where the value of the mortgage is greater than the value of the house. So to deal with that problem, which really is one of the reasons why you're seeing so much problems with the uh, mortgage-backed securities that these mortgages go into, is to try to get those people in a better situation. So on a case-by-case -case basis, not rewarding speculators, making sure it's only for people that are in their houses, people that have the uh, credit worthiness to uh, get a new mortgage, that those, are, those people are helped directly. And so it's not just focusing on the financial institutions and their balance sheets, which is an important part of this, but also focusing on the individuals who have the mortgages which are, go into these mortgage-backed securities. So I think it's very important to do both of these. And in both cases, the questions you raise are important, and that is at you know, what price the government goes in. They're struggling with a, a mechanism to determine what price to pay for the so-called uh, troubled assets or toxic assets, whether you use an auction or not. And the same kind of issues come into play with the individual mortgage owners. But you can't forget about that because that's really the source of the problem with respect to the mortgage-backed security. So both are very important in my view. On uh, my left, upstairs. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Jeff Fenton, uh, School of Engineering graduate student, class of 1982. Much of the uh, blame for this crisis has been, is being laid to the innovation of new financial securities that nobody understands and nobody can manage. As part of the new regulatory regime that is needed, should derivatives and other innovations be abolished? And should financial engineers be sent back to do civil engineering or electrical engineering? <laughs> and uh. actually build and make things that benefit society? You are a tough crowd, but Daryl, I'm going to give it to you. That, that's a great question. <laughs> that was a softball one. Uh, I was reading the financial press this week, and I noticed that a, a company in the United Kingdom, a sports goods company that sells tennis rackets and skis and so on, they're failing. And the reason they're failing is that the vendors that send them the skis and the tennis rackets won't get paid for 30 days, and they need to take out insurance against uh, this, this uh, sports company from failing. They can't get, they can't get the insurance because the credit derivatives for that kind of insurance are not working right with this credit crisis. It's at a time, and, and so this sports company is probably not going to make it. It's at a time when there's a lot of risk that you need a way to insure yourself against risk. So now more than ever, we need good financial engineering, not like it was done before, better. This is, this is, <laughs> this is what uh, President Hennessy this morning referred to big, hairy, audacious goals. <laughs> These financial engineering is now the BHAG of Wall Street. This is what has to be done far better. They have to understand how to model the risks, how to uh, collect securities and split them up again in a way that's much more easily understood, more transparent. The valuation, the risk management, the credit rating of all of these instruments has been very poorly done over the last five to 10 years. And I've been out speaking quite vocally about that. So we just have to do it better, but we don't want to get rid of it. Uh, it's the way that we actually manage that risk rather than just sit on it. My uh, left on the lower floor. I'm Jan Mayers. My wife, Lois Hassey Mayers, is a member of the class of 58. My question is based on the assumption and belief that all financial institutions have a group of people who are responsible for managing the risk and advising on the risk of those corporations. Were they rolled by the CEOs or incompetent? <laughs> you and I are both uh, masters of loaded questions. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Dennis, you want to try that one? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, uh, 
my answer would be that a lot of business models were developed in recent years that assumed an experience of sort of in the normal distribution, and we've been dealing with tail risks. You just think of the statistical way of dealing with it. And uh, some of those business models have just proven not to hold up under the very severe conditions. Central to the problem, whether you're talking about the largest banks in the world or community banks, is the dependence on wholesale funding. One of the principles I learned early in my banking career is the further away you get from core deposits of real people, retail deposits, the more risk you're taking. For years, institutions built up their balance sheets taking in wholesale deposits from capital markets, money markets, brokered deposits, and so forth, which in normal times was worked. It worked fine. We have not been in normal times. I think what will come out of this experience is a reconsideration of some of those fundamental policies. The investment banks, and they were, we, we really, with the conversion of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley to bank holding companies, are no longer the old typical investment banks. But they were built upon a business model of wholesale money, often very short term, and high leverage. A community bank at the absolute other end of the spectrum in my part of the world has been built on concentration in real estate lending locally, often development lending, with a fair amount of brokered deposits that come in at $100,000 clips from all over the country. Both of those do not stand up to the current circumstances. So I think managements will have learned from this experience, are going to reconsider their fundamental policies, and we're going to see in the coming years, I would say, some very radical changes in the business models of financial companies. Darrell wanted to add a word. I just want to follow up. This is what, what I would consider one of the most important failures of management at financial institutions. The risk management and the compensation policies of large financial institutions encouraged traders to take a lot of risk and get immediate compensation for it because their compensation structures were designed that way. And it discouraged risk managers from standing up at a management meeting and say, we're making a lot of profit, but I think we should stop making so much profit because I'm not sure that this is safe. Somehow or other, those risk managers. Somehow those risk managers were implicitly or explicitly told to sit down and not make such a fuss because we're making a lot of money in the meantime. So the risk manager has to get a, a, a bigger seat at the table. Yeah, that actually slightly reminds me. There was a, a I remember that uh, President Summers at uh, Harvard, a guy came in and, uh, from the endowment and said, we beat our benchmark by 15%. And Larry said, hmm, must have taken a lot of risk, huh? <laughs> here, over here. John, 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 can you please repeat the questions? The auditorium cannot pick up the questions from the mics. All right. Okay. So this is from one of the satellite auditoriums. It's from an alum by the name of David Cantanzare, class of 78. Are there other countries that are aligned to follow Iceland? I think you heard the question, but the question is, are there other countries that will uh, follow Iceland? Um, who would like to grab that one? Anybody willing to take that? We're, we're in the uh, double speed round? The double answer, speed round. The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are institutions that uh, are, are larger than the economies in which they reside, and uh, therefore their governments uh, you know, frankly, are not all in positions to be able to uh, bail them out. But I, but I don't think, there's not a lot of talk these days of other specific countries. There's more concern, I think, that you will get something like an AIG, let's say, in Europe. That that would be the next big problem rather than in Iceland. Upstairs on this side. Um, excuse me. Ashley Figline, class of 1993. Um, Mark Wolfson mentioned that we're probably going to need more than even the $700 billion bailout that we currently have. Um, my question is, how are we going to pay for this? As a senior member of the private equity community, are you prepared to do your part in giving up the carried interest? Paul? 
Um, and John Taylor, as an advisor to McCain, it seems that his policy seems to be to just cut spending across the board, which is bludgeoning the patient that needs surgery with a laser. Would you advise him to close these tax holes for the loopholes for the wealthy and be more thoughtful on cutting spending? So I'm not going to repeat the whole question, but the main question was uh, how are we going to pay for the uh, rescue plans, which Mark said had to be much bigger than $700 billion. Uh, and also, I think there's some request that John say a few things. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> so my motivation in recommending that we need massive increases in the amount of uh, uh, a bailout is actually to diminish the amount that taxpayers will be on the hook for. Failure to do it will result in even larger costs to the system, all of which we will pay. As to whether uh, the, uh, the nastier part of the question pertaining to uh, the private equity community, uh, 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 the, uh, certainly there will be uh, increasing amounts of taxes that need to be paid uh, by the wealthy to finance uh, the cost of uh, shoring up the system. Uh, I have no doubt that that will occur, whoever is the next president. John, you want to say <laughs> Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question about uh, a proposed spending freeze. It, uh, Senator McCain actually has uh, outlined that as part of his overall economic package for quite a while. It's a one-year one year freeze, and it excludes certain important things like our military and veterans' benefits. Um, and, and by the way, a freeze means that certain things can go up and certain things come down. But I just think, just have, just think about this for a second. One-year freeze means for one year, the government doesn't increase the amount it spends. Don't you think that's something we can do just for one year we hold off in increasing the amount we spend. And that's in the context of an enormous spending binge, which we've had, unfortunately, for a good part of the last 10 years. So I think it's really important to do this. And of course, with respect to loopholes, absolutely. It's, it's ridiculous, some of the loopholes are out there. And if we can also do that in the context of having a program that creates jobs, you know, some people talk about uh, what you need to do to create jobs. It seems to me what you've got to do is give incentives to firms to hire people. You know, that's where the jobs come from. Firms hire people. So you need to give incentives for firms to hire people. You, have, you don't increase their taxes. That's backwards. Mm -hmm. Who would increase taxes at a time like this? It's completely backwards. And so the whole program is something you need to think about. And uh, I think a one-year spending freeze, quite frankly, makes a lot of sense. Upstairs on my left. Hi, Ben Eifert, class of 2003, uh, current economics PhD student. Uh, <laughs> question for uh, Professor Duffy. Uh, in his role as an educator at Stanford, uh, you've touched on this a bit earlier, but clearly at the heart of this whole mess is sort of a massive breakdown in risk and credit risk analytics and uh, financial engineering that's in, in many ways deeply technical. Uh, banks and rating agencies collectively have quantitative groups with hundreds of PhDs in math, physics, and finance trying to sort of price these complex derivative instruments and understand the risks inherent in them. Uh, the math and physics guys are phenomenal at solving stochastic differential equations, and the finance guys are sort of trained in efficient markets theory. Is there a gap in the training systems at the university level? There are schools now like, top schools like Columbia, Carnegie Mellon, and an unnamed university across the bay that have formal financial engineering programs in the business schools that are designed precisely to train people in sort of real world financial engineering. Uh, is that a gap at Stanford? Should the business school be thinking about, you know, keep masters and PhD level training in sort of precisely this type of thing? Uh, we have a financial mathematics program and I think your question's premise uh, recognizes that it's not housed within the business school. On the other hand, the business school is a partner in that program. It's a very small program. The, the principle of that program is to start it small and to build it, and as we build it, to make its quality the best. Um, the programs that you mentioned are also very good. One of the problems with all of the mathematics that you described is not that the Wall Street engineers 
didn't have the math is that they didn't have enough common sense about where to apply it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they were looking at the past to get their data, and the future is not always like the past. So looking around the corners and, and imagining what changes when lenders are no longer at risk and they're passing on the risks, what changes in the way that home mortgages will default, that, that's important, and it's not going to be in the math. Downstairs on my left. This is a question from an alum in one of our satellite auditoriums. Marion Froelich, class of 73, has a question for Mark Wolfson. Do you have any concerns regarding broadening the authority of the Secretary of the Treasury, despite your fantasy of a benevolent dictator? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, uh, do we dare risk endowing uh, a small number of key decision makers with, with as much power uh, as uh, uh, may be necessary in order to move quickly to shore up our financial system. You know, um, I think that uh, there are always trade-offs between broad-based decision-making and, uh, uh, and endowing decision rights in, the ha in, in concentrated hands. And I think that uh, one has to worry about costs of omission, one has to worry about costs of commission. I think that during periods of greatest crisis, uh, we find ourselves with uh, facing errors of omission being our greatest potential cost. Failure to act to shore up the confidence to get the markets going again uh, poses the greater risk than uh, abuse of that concentrated decision-making right. So I think that, uh, I think that uh, there is a gross misunderestimation uh, <laughs> This <laughs> underestimation. <laughs> yeah. It's an HBS phrase. Uh, gross <laughs> underestimation. <laughs> it's, it's the male form. <laughs> of the uh, of of the uh, of the talent and the resolve of of. Uh, of senior management in central banks around the world, of treasury uh, uh, members that is senior, senior staff in treasury uh, around the world. And I think that uh, that is not sufficiently visible to uh, politicians, mm -hmm. not sufficiently visible to the average uh, voter, but uh, it's something that gives me a great deal of comfort. There's an enormous amount of talent there, and I think it's the one great hope of getting our system back on track. I'm uh, John Luce from the class of 1963. <clears throat> We've heard a lot uh, about what Senator McCain might do as president. In the interest of fairness, uh, I wonder if, and recognizing, <laughs> recognizing that the panelists may not be advising uh, Senator Obama, I wonder if they might at least speculate about what he might do as president. And you will take that? I, I'm going to uh, address that to Ann. Uh, uh, I think that's a perfectly fine question. <laughs> I, I'm not going to address it to John Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Uh, well, I am not advising the Obama campaign, although I, do, I know some people who, who are uh, part of the network of advisors. I think at this point it's hard to say specifically what will be done, especially because I think we have to be fair. Every, everyone, once they get into the office of being president, and particularly in very tumultuous times, has to deal with the cards as they are on the table. Bill Clinton really wanted to do some important fiscal stimulus, and what he found out was because of the budget deficit, he wasn't able to do that. And he had, people said he had to choose between the two Bobs, Bob Rubin and Bob Reich. And he chose Bob Rubin, and he focused more on the deficit. I think uh, if Obama is president, he is going to face that. I think he's going to want to have certain kinds of targeted fiscal stimulus. But frankly, I think uh, you know, early on, people are really going to have to focus on stabilizing the financial system and addressing the budget deficit and the current account deficit, because many people think we're not going to be able to run this level of current account deficit for very long. I think it's interesting to um, just observe that Bob Rubin is very active in advising 
um, the Obama campaign at this point. I think uh, Larry Summers, who has a lot of experience in things like persistent current account deficits, is also involved. And so you do have some people who are very experienced in international economics and also in the plumbing of the financial system who will be involved uh, if it's the case that Obama is president. Just realistically, if you're standing up waiting for a question, I'm going to try to get one more round. Upstairs on to my right. Okay, this is from the Satellite Auditorium. Uh, what would you advise the individual investor to do? <laughs> I would uh, I, I practice putting your head between your knees. <laughs> Stretching exercises would be helpful in this regard. Uh, it, it very much depends on your circumstance. So first of all, uh, uh, this is a time where you need to be sure that you've got a sleep at night portfolio of sufficient magnitude to protect your standard of living for the next 10 years. Uh, if, if you don't have that, then, you're, then your options are limited. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, this is also not a time uh, to uh, have a knee-jerk reaction and completely sell out of equities. Uh, by, any, by all historical standards, the bounce back in equity prices tends to be far quicker than the drawdown in equity prices during uh, uh, equity price collapses. Uh, even though we may experience a weak economy for the next uh, uh, year or even longer, the equity markets uh, uh, regularly anticipate the end of economic weakness by uh, six months or longer. Uh, and that's because equity prices reflect cash flows out into the distant, distant future. Uh, so uh, basically, I think that uh, if one were thinking about what to do in the short run, one should uh, Avoid the things that we haven't heard about yet. Should avoid investing in commercial real estate, which I think is the next disaster waiting to happen. Uh, but over longer periods of time, I think one should anticipate that the emerging markets will continue their rapid growth. Great place to allocate uh, capital over the next three to five years. Not unrelated to that is that there will be a restoration of the commodity boom, notwithstanding the collapse we've seen uh, in, the, in the short period of time. Recently, it will be tied to the demand that comes from the hundreds of millions, even billions of new consumers that uh, become the new middle class in the emerging countries. Uh, if you have the luxury of it, uh, this will probably want to be one of the great times to be investing fresh capital into the private equity markets. Once again, this is where the return to liquidity, be, uh, to supplying liquidity becomes the highest. Uh, if you look at the last uh, two recessions we had, 91 and 2001, the highest returning periods of time to be invested in private equity were 1991, 92, 93, 2001, 2002, 2003. We got a, upstairs, oh, by the way, I, I wanted to tell you that you haven't lost too much money uh, while you've been here. Uh, it's down about the same amount it was at the beginning of the session. <laughs> <laughs> upstairs on my left. This is from one of our satellite um, viewing stations. Should a speculative home buyer bear any responsibility and loss for his or her decisions and actions in the event of a significant homeowner bailout? John Taylor, that might be yours. Well, I mean, yes. We, you know, if someone has um, speculated in the sense of taking positions that involved way too much risk uh, compared to what they were um, capable of handling, then they should be responsible for that. You know, people are responsible. That's the thing we've all been talking at this table, at this panel right here, is that there's too little responsibility taken, whether you're a CEO or whether you're a small bank or whether you're borrowing. And so, no, you don't want to reward people who take uh, too much risk by letting them benefit from that. That's the whole problem has gotten into this too much risk situation. So, so I always say it's a case by case basis uh, with respect to helping the homeowners, people who live in their homes, people who are able to 
uh, deal with a new mortgage with the terms they have, with the credit capabilities they have. And that's the only way you can deal with this problem is on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, there's a saying among uh, stand-up comedians, which is, quit when they want more. <laughs> I'm afraid we're going to have to quit. I, I know you want more. Uh, and I think it's a testimony to the panel. Thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, before I, before I dis dismiss you to go to your class lunches and other events, I have some housekeeping matters to attend to. First and foremost, I want to remind each and every one of you of the special roundtable discussion being held tomorrow morning at 9.15 a.m. in Maples Pavilion. If you like this panel, you're going to love tomorrow's panel. The panel is entitled Wanted, Courage, Compassion, and Character, Leadership for the 21st Century. And it will be hosted by President John Hennessy and moderated by Tom Brokaw. In addition, the panelists include the following group of distinguished thought leaders. Stanford alumnus and Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable Anthony Kennedy. U.S. Congressman and Stanford alumnus, Javier Becerra. Stanford alumna and former CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorina. Pulitzer Prize winning Stanford Professor of History and alumnus David Kennedy, Stanford alumnus and CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Jeff Rakes, and CEO for the Global Fund for Women Kavita Ramdas. Even in Stanford terms, this is a stunning lineup. Please join us tomorrow morning for what we know will be a wonderfully provocative and tremendously educational event. Now, we understand that your schedules are quite full this evening with reunion merriment and that many of you won't be settling down until quite late. We cons consequently want to remind you to set your alarm clocks because you don't want to be late. The program will be starting at exactly 9.15 a.m. Thank you again for coming here today. One more round of applause for our panel, please. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.